Hi, welcome everyone uh, to the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Cheryl Howard Neal, and I am with the Illinois Mentoring Partnership, and I will be walking you through our webinar. Today we're going to be talking about STEM mentoring, and mentoring programs are increasingly focusing on science and technology, engineering and math, which is STEM, and this reflects our national academic priority. Although the benefits and importance of STEM are evident, it's often difficult for practitioners to implement STEM activities without having expertise in these subjects. And our panelists today, we're going to explore how to incorporate STEM activities into your program model and how to partner with schools and businesses and describe their experiences facilitating STEM mentoring programs. So we're in for a really good, a really good activity today. So who are uh, the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series? It is funded by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention through a National Mentoring Resource Center and facilitated in partnership with Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership. These webinars would not be possible without the planning team, which includes all the wonderful mentoring partnerships shown on the slide. This series is supported by the Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership. And in addition to the webinar series, the National Mentoring Resource Center provides resources such as free technical assistance and training for mentoring champions just like you. And at the end of the webinar, we'll provide more details about how you can access this free support. A couple of things we want to highlight for you is that before we get started, I want to make sure that we do some housekeeping information. One week after the webinar, you'll receive an email with information about how to download a copy of the slides and view the webinar recording. You can also access this information directly by going to Mentor's website. And to continually improve the series, because we always want to get better and stronger, we're looking for your input. So a short survey will pop up as you exit the webinar today. Please take just a few minutes to complete that. It really helps us in, in working on the webinar and making it more effective for you. So we want this to be a participatory experience. We don't want to just talk at you. We want you to participate and share your insight and ask questions. So please use the question box to ask questions throughout the webinar. Melissa will be fielding questions for us. She is our question moderator, and she'll be queuing up your questions all along the way. And the questions can be directed directly to the panelists. And if we can't get to all the questions, because today I'm happy to report we have about 380 people on the call. So we won't be able to get to all of them, but we're going to get to a ton of them. We're going to do our very, very best. So first, we have a poll just to get us started, really short. Uh, the first poll question is, what is your experience level in the mentoring field? Is it beginner, experienced, or expert? And we're going to give you a second to do it. Okay, so let's see. All right, for this call, we have a lot of experienced people. So experienced uh, folks, about 59%, beginners, about 28%, and expert, 13%. So we should have a really rich discussion today. Excellent. And one more question for you. What is your role in the mentoring field? Are you a practitioner, a researcher, a technical assistance provider, a funder? or something else. And we'll give you, again, just a couple seconds to do it. All right, it looks like we have a lot of practitioners on the line, which is awesome, uh, followed up by other. And we'd be curious to find out what the other, what other folks are doing in the field. And if you want to put that in your chat box, we can always report that out. Uh, also, we have some researchers. We have uh, some technical assistance providers and a few funders. But for the others, that seems like a pretty big group at 28%. If you're willing to share what it is you do in the mentoring field or youth development field, we would love to hear that as well. So thank you for that. 
So today, let's move on to our discussion. We have some wonderful uh, panelists with us today uh, that, that are going to give us a really good insight into STEM, uh, STEM mentoring. So let's see who's joining us. We have two practitioners. One, first up, is Laura Batt. And Laura's director of STEM programs at C Research Foundation's Mystic Aquarium. And she is based out of Connecticut. Uh, she has more than 15 years of experience engaging youth in STEM activities in formal and informal settings. During the past decade, she has focused on development of multimedia STEM curricula for implementing in for, in, for implementation in group mentoring settings. A former middle school math and science teacher, Laura holds an Indiana teaching license in physics for grades 5 through 12. Welcome, Laura. We are also joined by Charlie Lindquist. Charlie Lindquist joins the Illinois, joined the Illinois Tech Global Leaders Program in November of 2014 as an AmeriCorps VISTA. He transitioned into this role as a program coordinator for community innovations projects in June of 2015. He is very passionate about service learning and loves supporting uh, Global Leaders Program scholars as they work to positively impact their communities. Charlie received his bachelor's degree in political science and sociology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and he believes that mentors have the ability to empower youth to be agents of change. And that's me. Cheryl Howard Neal. I am Director of Programs here at the Illinois Mentoring Partnership. Uh, my experience uh, is about 20 years in the field of, of nonprofit, of the nonprofit sector, and working with mentoring programs and volunteers and youth. Uh, here at IMP, I facilitate trainings and workshops to mentoring programs, and I help disseminate information about best practice, and I work with organizations to review their policies and procedures, and I assist them in creating work plans to ultimately strengthen their program. And then prior to IMP, I worked at Big Brothers Big Sisters of Metropolitan Chicago for five years, and I'm a native of Chicago, and I graduated from DePaul University, which is also here in Chicago, with a BA in political science and a minor in communications. So, are you ready for STEM? The picture you see on the screen, that's actually my son. That is uh, Ronald. He is six years old. He is uh, just now finishing up kindergarten uh, here in Chicago. Uh, school ends for us on June 21st, so he's just mere days away from finishing his uh, kindergarten uh, career, and he'll be headed off to first grade in the fall. He's involved in STEM. The program that he participates in is called Chassis which is the Chicago Pre-College Pre -college Science and Engineering Program. So when we originally talked about, you know, different topics for this webinar, this came to the forefront for me because obviously I have a connection to it because my son is participating. STEM is important, you know, STEM is important and it's engaging and the skills that you learn from, from STEM, even at the young age that he is, the six years old, the things that he's learning and the way that he's able to articulate uh, the things that he is learning and put them into practice is just amazing. So I feel like it's, it's definitely a gateway for our kids and the youth that we serve. So yeah, we're ready for STEM. We're good to go. Why do youth need STEM? STEM is their future, right? STEM is, is key in all the things that we do. And it's the age in which we live, right? It's their best career options. It's their key to developing skills that are transferable. And it's everywhere, from natural resources to the smartphones and computers and tablets that we use every single day. To, to civil engineering and the roads that we, that, that we drive on. STEM is absolutely everywhere, so it's shaping our lives as we speak. So how can STEM help youth? Some of the activities that the STEM activities provide us, you know, and it's not just about math and science, right? That's not the case. You know, a lot of times kids will tell us that, you know, I'm not good at math or I'm not good at science. The nice thing about STEM is that it's not just that. It's so much more than just the math and science that you take in school. There are so many transferable skills that kids can take away from STEM programming, such as problem solving. 
problem solving is something that you're going to do your entire life in every, every realm of your life. So learning skills that's going to help you to problem solve is key. Being critical thinking, being critical thinkers, and being able to dissect a problem and come up with solutions. Being innovative and creative and, come, and thinking outside the box, right? Schools don't always allow us to do that. So having, having STEM programming that really pushes kids to step outside their comfort zone and be creative and think a little bit more intuitively about the world and things around them. Learning to be uh, connect, uh, to be uh, to communicate effectively, you know, because a lot of times in STEM you're working in teams, so you have to learn how to communicate with people. And then building self-esteem, self-esteem that, that my son has seen just in the program that he's in, when he is able to put something together, when he is able to figure out a, a solution to a problem, the self-esteem and the pride that he has in knowing he was able to do that is is, is immeasurable. And then ultimately they become what? Leaders. They're leaders because they're able to do something and show what they've produced and show that, that hey, this was a problem. This is how I solved the problem. So they're becoming leaders as well. So all these skills are completely transferable, which is key. Now, I'm not going to talk at you anymore. I'm going to turn it over to, to, to our esteemed panelists, and, and they're going to explain their awesome programs to you. And I'm going to turn it over to Laura. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Well, what I'd like to start out with is uh, telling people a little bit about the STEM mentoring program that my organization is involved with. And then hopefully, as we get into the webinar a little bit deeper, translate our experience into some takeaways that will be hopefully be helpful to anybody who's interested in STEM or mentoring or both. So I work for an organization called Sea Research Foundation. We're a nonprofit and we focus on conservation, education, research, and youth development. Uh, we're very fortunate and grateful to have received support from OJJDP over the past several years to help fund our STEM mentoring efforts and to bring them to uh, many youth across the country. Currently, we're implementing our program with about 2,500 youth, and we have a, a mentor to mentee ratio of one to four, so about a fourth that many mentors in more than four, 100 youth serving organizations all across the United States. Our STEM mentoring program that we're currently operating targets underserved youth ages six to nine. And what we do is we connect those youth with adult or teen mentors, and they participate together in structured, hands-on STEM activities and interactive technologies. And so the idea of our program is to both bring these youth a role model, be it a peer mentor or an adult, and to have them share the experience of doing the STEM activities together. They cover a variety of STEM topics, with a particular focus on conservation. So the three modules that everybody's participating in this year include uh, an adapted version of the Junior First Lego League WasteWise Challenge, which is a 12-week program in which the youth and their mentors investigate recycling and trash, and they pick a topic to uh, research in more depth, and then they build a motorized Lego model to show what they've learned. And then the next module that they do uh, is traditionally implemented over the summer, and it's a baseball math curriculum that we developed in partnership with the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation. And the youth and their mentors play a game called Quick Ball, which is kind of like baseball but faster, while they're also learning key math concepts. And then this fall, they'll all be participating in our Endangered Species Adventure, where they learn about endangered and threatened animals and how they can help them both at home and around the world. So just to give you a taste, it's a wide variety of topics with science, technology, engineering, and math all incorporated. Our overall goal is to positively impact the social development and the academic achievement of all the youth participating in the program. We have a variety of expected outcomes that uh, follow those two tiers of the program, the mentoring and the STEM side. So the first few here are what we hope they get out of their mentoring relationship, which is a desire to keep on in this mentoring program or others, 
to increase their positive relationship with their mentors and then also to improve on whatever their particular goals are that they work out with their mentor at the start of the program. And then as a result of doing the STEM activities and the enrichment activities with their mentors, we hope that they increase their interest in academics, particularly in STEM areas, and then also that they just increase their awareness and interest in STEM-related careers. We found that, especially with this age group, six to nine years old, some of these kids don't have any idea what sorts of jobs are out there beyond the traditional ones that they see on TV or in books, and they might not know that there's a job that is a lot like playing video games where you're driving an underwater robot and doing ocean exploration at sea or even being a cook on a research ship. Uh, th those are all types of things that use STEM that they might not even know about. So we hope to bring awareness of those things to the youth in the program. Our model is based on group mentoring. So as I mentioned before, it's at least one mentor to four mentees, regardless of the program size. So you could implement uh, the program that we have designed with just four kids and one teenager who's their mentor, or you could do it with 24 youth and six mentors all at once. We do have some of our sites that end up pairing more than one mentor with each small group. So for example, they might have an adult mentor from the community plus a teen from their site with the group of four six to nine year olds. And that's actually been a really successful model because if for some reason one of the mentors can't come, they're sick or something comes up or they're out of town, that small group still has somebody who knows what's going on internally with that group and can maintain consistency for them. And then we hope that the matches are kept consistent throughout the program. So this isn't, you know, you opt in for the first curriculum module and then you leave and the mentors leave and then you have new kids sign up for the next module. We really want this to be an extended relationship. And so we ask that everybody at the start commit to participating for the entire year and hopefully longer if, if all is going well. The elements of our particular program can be broken into three parts. There are hands-on activities, and those are the, I would say, the main component of the program. So most of our sites run the program on a weekly basis for about an hour after school, although it is run at some sites in school as well. Um, but for the after school versions, they might meet, say, Wednesdays at 5 p.m. And uh, they would do one activity per week that would involve some sort of hands-on component. At the end of each of those activities are a list of multimedia connections. And those could be online games or videos or other sorts of resources that could be used during the activity session. But we also encourage the youth to then go home and share those with their family members. They're all available on our website, not behind the gate, so that if they see a video about an animal that's really interesting to them, or if they're doing research on their recycling for their Lego model project and they want to learn more, they can go home and continue that learning and share that with their families. And then the last piece is STEM enrichment activities. And we require our sites to do at least one of those per module. They could do more if they want. But those activities uh, expose the youth to scientists and engineers and conservationists who they might not otherwise come across. That can either be through field trips or through guest speakers coming to the site or through the youth themselves hosting an expo or a fair where they share with their families and community what it is they've been working on. So this just gives you an overview of what each of our sessions looks like. Uh, and this is, again, what the majority of the time is spent on during the weekly sessions. We start with a warm-up. So that's usually some kind of quick, fun, team-building sort of activity to get everybody uh, at the beginning to learn a, a little more about each other, names and what they like and things like that. And then as it goes on, uh, more team-building skills throughout the program so that it's not just all STEM all the time, but we're also giving the mentees and the mentors a chance to get to know one another on a, a little bit a deeper level. And then after that, we have a, a very short reading selection to kind of set the stage for whatever the hands-on activity is going to be. And you know, we feel that is really important, uh, as important 
as STEM, and so we try to make them really high interest reading selections. And if the kids uh, can read, you know, some six to nine year olds are quite proficient in that. They they can read it. It's they're written at a second grade level usually. And then if not, they can have their mentors read it to them while they follow along or take turns. And by the end of the year, we often see that uh, the kids have gained a lot of confidence in being willing to open up and attempt to read the passages in their small group because they know it's a safe space. Um, that's followed by the do, which is the hands-on activity, which might be, you know, I think in the picture on the left here, these kids are designing a net to only catch certain types of fish that are represented by different kinds of candy while excluding others. And in the middle, they're playing a, a food web game. And then on the right, they're going over the reading selection. Uh, and then we have the multimedia connections, which I already talked about what those are. So then lastly, just a little more about these STEM enrichment activities. They are so important to really make the connection for kids as to how STEM impacts their daily lives. So on the left here is a, a picture of some kids at a Boys and Girls Club who are showing off their Lego projects at the end of that module. And families are invited, you know, the press is invited, the community is invited. It's a great way to really get everybody to see the great things that the kids are doing through the program. Um, and then the other two pictures here show field trips that the kids were able to go on through uh, this program to get out to a zoo or an aquarium or somewhere where they can see STEM in action, a college or a university, or even bring some of that into their own site. We've had sites take virtual field trips uh, to a sea turtle hospital uh, offered by a place down in Florida. So even if they don't live on the coast or can't get to a place themselves, they can bring that into their site. Awesome. Thanks so much, Laura. And now we're going to turn it over to Charlie. Thank you, Cheryl. It's kind of similar to Laura. I just want to give an overview of my program and the goals of the program that I work with. So I work for the Illinois Tech Global Leaders Program, and we're an organization housed here in Chicago at Illinois Institute of Technology, which is a university here in Chicago. And we work with Chicago area high school students who are juniors and seniors. And we seek to inspire the students in our program to serve and lead their communities through STEM and to pursue higher education. And our program has three main goals. The first is to expose students to STEM through hands-on project-based learning, where they're really getting to understand different careers and fields in STEM by collaborating together and working on projects. Um, the second goal of our program is to really help our students develop their leadership skills and abilities um, so that they are confident when they pursue careers in STEM in the future or however they choose to interact with STEM in the future. And then the third goal of our program is to encourage our students to pursue higher education and to matriculate to college. And so we provide college application assistance and help students think critically about um, how they're going to explore STEM when they go to college and when they graduate from high school. So our program is free for the students to participate, and it takes place over two years. So students apply to our program the, their sophomore year of high school. We're a selective enrichment program, and we juniors and seniors participate in our program. So over the course of those two years, we have a lot of different programming that students participate in. We host two summer leadership sessions here at Illinois Institute of Technology, where our scholars, where our over 100 scholars are on campus, and they're participating in hands-on projects focused on engineering and architecture and mathematics, and they're working in groups on these projects in the summer. And then during their junior year of the program, our students work on year-long community-based projects where they use their STEM skills to design solutions to community issues that they care about and that they see as important. And then during senior year, we provide college advising and applications, application assistance to our students, and we help them complete college applications and apply to other college programs such as Posse and QuestBridge and think critically about different majors they'd like to pursue in the STEM fields. And then throughout both of those years, we provide professional development workshops for our students, um, field trips to different companies and organizations, organizations in Chicago um, that work in the STEM fields, and also career exploration opportunities such as career fairs and, and college networking fairs as well, they're where they're able to talk with STEM professionals um, and students too. 
And just a little bit of background information about the scholars who are in our program. So we have approximately 110 scholars currently enrolled in our program, and we seek to provide opportunities for, for students from under um, resourced and underrepresented backgrounds in the STEM fields and in higher education to thrive and to develop as leaders. And the students that are in our program are really motivated and they want to make a difference and they want to learn more about STEM. Um, so a majority of our students hail from the Chicagoland area um, or Chicago. Um, about 83% of our students come from Chicago public schools or affiliated charter schools. And then we also have students from surrounding suburbs and communities as well. There are students from over 63 different Chicago area high schools in our program. We really pride our, ourselves on the diversity of our program and we really think that students are able to um, offer their diverse perspectives when they're, when they're investigating STEM together in groups. And then a majority of our students are also first generation and will be the first in their families to attend college. And majority of our students are also students of color. Um, and we really want to provide these students who are underrepresented in STEM with the resources and tools to be leaders in the STEM fields and to kind of prepare themselves for college. And with our program, we really want to help our students connect with STEM and in, in a way that's meaningful to them and a way that they really benefit from and enjoy. And so when we're developing our curriculum for our students, we kind of center our curriculum on complex problems and issues that they really care about in their communities. And those issues range from sustainability to violence prevention in the city of Chicago um, to access to education. Um, and we think that when we kind of root our curriculum in these issues, our students really are able to develop as leaders um, because they're using STEM to investigate issues that matter to them. Um, and, and our program is also grounded in a design thinking framework. And design thinking is an engineering framework in which students are introduced um, to an issue and that they do in-depth research on an issue and try to understand how it impacts people. And then they prototype the solution to that issue and then receive feedback and then make iterations to their prototype um, and continue to test it out. Um, and so with that design thinking framework, they're able to focus on next steps that they can take to continue to um, create change with that issue and to make a difference not only in our program but also in our communities as well. And to touch a little bit on how we build our curriculum and, and how our students engage in STEM with our program. Um, so all of our programming is project-based learning. We really think students benefit from participating in hands-on projects where they're working together to explore an issue. And so with the different programming that we have our students participate in throughout their two years, we really like to build up their independence with how they're investigating and engaging with STEM. And so as you can see on this model, our students start off with smaller classroom-based projects, which are you know, short STEM activities that take place in the afternoon of our summer session. And then they continue to do more independent projects where they work with real world partners and build up more and more independence with these projects. So the first project um, or STEM activity that our scholars work on when they enter the program are project challenges, which are four hour classroom based projects where they work in teams of about 15 to 17 to learn about an issue and then design and prototype a, uh, a solution to that issue. So this summer, for example, our students are um, going to be prototyping new food labels um, to have in grocery stores. Um, so people are able to better understand the food that they're putting in their bodies and the different um, nutritional components of those foods. And so students will learn about nutrition and how that relates to obesity, and then they'll prototype um, new design labels. So it's really kind of a shortened activity, but it's a great opportunity for them to work in groups to explore a STEM issue um, in a short period of time. And then we build off of those shorter activities um, with our Serving Through STEM projects, where real world community partners and organizations in Chicago pose problems that, and issues that they're experiencing to our scholars. And then our scholars work over the course of six afternoons in the summer to design a solution and propose it to, the, to those partners um, that hopefully those partners are able to implement um, in the coming year. And so 
last summer, we partnered with Alliance for the Great Lakes and they proposed an issue to our scholars that there was a lot of littering on beaches and that beachgoers weren't recycling. And our scholars prototyped and 3D printed, designed um, different interactive garbage cans or waste baskets, so to say, that would help encourage beachgoers to recycle more and to educate themselves on the importance of recycling. Um, and they use the design thinking process to do this. And um, these products are facilitated by undergraduate students here at IIT um, who mentor and support our scholars in the process of these projects. And then the final component um, or the final projects that our scholars work on in, their, in our program that focuses on STEM are our community innovation projects where scholars identify a social issue in their community that they care about and they work over the course of 10 months to develop and implement a solution to that issue. And then they work in small teams of about six to eight and they're guided by adult professional project mentors in the STEM fields and in higher education, as well as undergraduate students here at Illinois Institute of Technology. And they um, are able to kind of prototype a solution to an issue. This year we had students who coded and created a website to educate um, parents on the CPS high school application process. We also had students build a bike generator um, and test that out at different nonprofit organizations in Chicago. Um, these projects are just a great opportunity for students to continue to build independence um, and learn how they can use STEM to positively change their communities. Great, thank you so much for that, Charlie and Laura. Your programs sound absolutely wonderful. Now we've got some questions for you. I'd like to ask you guys uh, some things and, uh, and see how you respond. First off, thinking about STEM, how does one, or I'll start it off by this. So in deciding to embark upon, you know, a kind of a STEM-focused curriculum, why STEM? Why did you decide to take on kind of, kind of that area of mentoring? Charlie. Definitely, that's a, a really great question. So with our program, we have definitely recognized that society is continuing to advance technologically. I mean, we view the STEM fields as opportunities to innovate and to really create positive change. Um, however, there's definitely a lack of diversity in the STEM fields and a lot of voices and ideas aren't being heard. And with our program, we really want to provide students who are underrepresented in STEM with the opportunity to connect with it more and to bring their experiences to the table. I mean, we think that underrepresented groups in STEM are untapped resources and that by adding diversity to STEM, um, we're able to promote more innovation and you know, stimulate more innovation and also increase opportunities for social and economic mobility and stability in our society. And so with our program, we really think it's important to increase the diversity of the STEM fields. And that's sort of why we chose um, to embark on a STEM-focused curriculum to balance innovation with diversity in these fields. Great. And also, in thinking about the, the population that you serve, Charlie, those are high school, you know, high school age kids. Laura, your population's a little bit younger. Why did you guys decide to take on STEM? Right, well sort of similar to Charlie, the problem that's there uh, starts early on and so we wanted to get kids excited and engaged in STEM at a young age so that they didn't uh, think throughout their school careers that it wasn't something that they could do or see themselves doing later on. And we also think it's a perfect pair for a mentoring program, especially one in which there are small groups because hands-on activities work really well with small groups, so it's an easy way to get kids and adults something to do that's fun together that not only helps them build their relationship, but also gives the kids uh, skills that they can use and the confidence to use them as they go on through their lives. Great. Also, you guys uh, had a chance to talk a little bit about the goals of your program. Can you talk a bit about what are some of the goals for the youth that participate in your program? Laura. Sure. So I mentioned that, you know, we sort of have the twofold goals, uh, one on the mentoring side of things and one on the STEM side of things, and we hope that those actually work together. So we want the kids to have an adult or an, an older peer who they feel comfortable talking with and that they can build a relationship with. And then we also hope that that relationship will help them navigate 
things in their lives that might be a little bit difficult for them. So it's a way to bring kids who might not sign up for a traditional mentoring program to one that involves STEM, it might be an entryway in for them to get some of those benefits that they can reap from any sort of mentoring program. And then we also hope that they get that awareness and interest in STEM and STEM careers out of it so that they, uh, some of the kids, you know, in the recruitment phases, if you're six, you probably have no clue what STEM is other than part of a plant or something. And so there's some education that has to happen initially, but once they see that it involves mixing things and designing things and building things and, you know, even with the, the baseball math curriculum, we hope baseball gets them excited even if the math doesn't at first, but that then they realize that actually math can be a lot of fun and is in a lot of sports and is really important too. Totally. And Charlie, because your kids are, are and they're, they're, they're young adults at this point, you're, you're, you've got the higher end of the high school age youth. What are some goals you have for, for, for those students? Definitely. So with the students that we work with who are juniors and seniors in high school, I'm kind of similar to the slide that I went over with our goals, we really want to help develop our students' confidence in their leadership abilities. A lot of our scholars um, enter our program at different levels um, and from a wide range of backgrounds, and oftentimes our scholars aren't confident in their ideas and in their creativity. And so through kind of participating in hands-on projects and programming with our program, um, with the Global Leaders Program, we want them to gain confidence in their abilities to be innovators and to be very creative in STEM so that when they go to college and they enter an engineering classroom or you know, a chemistry lab, they don't second guess themselves when they, you know, whether or not they're going to raise their hand and share an answer that they have or whether or not they're going to share ideas that they have when they're working in a group. We want them to believe in themselves um, and view themselves as leaders. And so that, I guess that's our first goal. And our second goal would be for our students um, to leave our program approaching STEM with a lens in which they consider the common good and how they can use STEM to make a difference in their communities. And since we are a mentoring program, um, our mentors that work with our scholars play a really big role in helping them see the connection between STEM and community service. And our mentors range from undergraduate students who are currently here at IIT doing research and working in the community to STEM professionals who are you know, engineers and scientists, and they really help our students see the relationship between um, STEM and the community. Because a lot of students enter our program thinking that engineers or computer scientists you know, don't have to talk with people very often or they don't work with community members. And you know, that's a bit of a misperception. And through our program, we want students to kind of break down that misperception and realize the various and you know, multiple ways that they can interact with STEM in the community um, to make a difference in things that they really care about. Great. Thank you for that. And just one more thing in thinking about, you know, kind of the mission and the overarching goals for your programs. How has your program made a difference in, in, in the kiddos that you serve? Laura. Well, that's a great question. It's one where we're very keen on finding the answers to. Um, so, you know, we administer surveys to all of our participants, uh, especially those in our grant funded programs. And what we find on them is that uh, youth are self-reporting that they are both gaining uh, positive impact from their mentors and then also with the STEM aspect of it. So a uh, large majority of them report that they like science more than they did when they started the mentoring program and that the mentor helped them improve their grades in school, but also just that having a mentor help them get along better with adults and that they enjoyed spending time with their mentor. And so we value all of those uh, aspects, outcomes of the program. We also, when we ask the, the youth, you know, what their favorite part of the program was, you know, we get answers like, I liked my mentor, Lauren, and now I want to go to school to be a nurse like her, or even just my favorite part is that my mentor understands me. So I think, you know, a lot of times you might say, oh, well, you know, isn't that just some kids and grown-ups or teenagers doing, you know, science activities? But there's really something deeper going on there, and that's what we're seeing as part of this, that the youth are really building their relationships with their mentors as they're doing these activities that also uh, makes them interested in the STEM topics. So, and then we also see that there's an impact on the mentors, that they report, you know, having a bond with their mentees and that 
for them being able to teach and learn at the same time is something uh, that they hadn't really expected before they got involved with this kind of a program where they're learning alongside the youth. Great. And Charlie, how about you in terms of, you know, moving the needle for, for the students that you're serving, that high school age student, what are you seeing? Definitely. Sort of similar to Laura, our students have also self-reported that their mentors for the different projects that they work on have helped them develop their leadership skills and their, their you know, belief that they're able to make a difference in their communities. And their mentors have really inspired them to kind of get out and to make things happen um, and help them believe that they have the agency and the resources to do that. Um, so that's something that's been really rewarding for us to see. And in terms of you know, other things that are, we feel like our program has really helped our students with, our program is very diverse. And so we have students from almost every community in Chicago participating um, over the course of two years. And with that diversity, our students have told us that they've really been able to learn about experiences and beliefs and kind of perspectives that they hadn't had the opportunity to hear from at their schools, which are oftentimes not as diverse as our program. Um, and that diversity really opens their eyes and it helps them develop more empathy um, and be really thoughtful leaders in the STEM fields. Um, and our mentors also play a really big role in that too by helping our students consider kind of what's going on outside of just their communities and kind of what's going on in Chicago as a whole as well as globally. Um, so those are kind of the benefits that we see our students share with us about their experience in the Global Leaders Program. That's great. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you for that. And now we're going to see if we have some questions from, from the audience. I'm going to turn it over to Melissa. Melissa, do we have any questions? Thank you so much, Cheryl. And yeah, we got a lot of great questions. Laura and Charlie, this is both for you, but Laura, could you answer this first? Are both STEM mentoring programs year-round? If so, how do you engage the mentor's commitment for the year, especially for undergraduate students who, mo who may leave for the summer? That's a great question. Yes, our program is year-round, uh, and it's definitely difficult to engage some mentors for the year. We find that really hammering home the commitment during the recruitment phase is critical, and that a lot of times uh, mentors will admit, potential mentors will admit that they don't know if they can actually commit to the full year, and what we tell our sites is, you know, keep going then. <laughs> Try to find somebody who can um, with undergraduates, often if they're not local, if it's a partnership with a college or university where the students go home over the summer, a model that's worked really well is the one I mentioned earlier, where sites will actually pair their mentees with a, a mentor who's older and then also a teen from the site. We work with a large number of boys and girls clubs that already have teenagers who come daily to their sites, and it's a great way for those teens to uh, help out the younger kids at, at the site. And oftentimes, if they're graduates of the program themselves, they are really eager to give back in that way. And then there's some sites, particularly in uh, rural locations or smaller places that simply shut down over the summer. And for those sites, we encourage them to run what we call the summer modules at the end of the school year or at the start of the next school year, if either the mentees or the mentors just can't make it work over the summer. Great, thanks so much, Laura. And actually, you answered that perfectly, and I have so many, many questions. Um, so Charlie, do you mind answering um, another one that I have? Um, I have one that says, I'm wondering how both programs maintain the rationale, or um, I'm wondering how your program maintains the rationale mentoring aspect when focusing on STEM activities. Do you feel matches get the opportunity to build a strong relationship when they're so active with STEM? Charlie, you might be muted. We can't hear you. Oh, thank you. Yes, I was muted. Thank you. So that's a really great question. Um, so with our program, we really think that our mentors um, have 
the time and the opportunity to commit to support our students with their projects. Um, and oftentimes, our mentors who are working with our students on their year-long service projects are equally passionate as our students are about the issue that they're exploring, whether that's sustainability or education access. Um, and because they're interested um, in the topic as well, they're really um, excited to support, to, you know, committing our, to support our students throughout the course of the year um, at the different workshops that we host and the, at the different activities that we have. And so our mentors are really engaged um, and excited to support our students because they also care about the issues that our scholars are addressing. Great. Thank you so much, Charlie. And we do have a lot of questions, but we're going to move on right now, and hopefully we can get to most of them <laughs> by the end. So we're going to move on. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Thanks, Melissa. Appreciate that. So let's talk a little bit about recruitment. Obviously, the program that we're talking about is more of a specialized kind of program is just focusing on STEM. Can you guys talk a bit about what the ideal youth, if there is an ideal, if there's an ideal type of youth that, that fits better in this type of program? And Laura, we're going to start with you. Sure. So for our program, since we're really working with young kids who may not have developed a passion for a certain area in their life yet, actually, again, might not even know what STEM is. We really uh, encourage our site coordinators to target recruiting youth who they think would benefit most from the program, either because they think they could use a mentor or because they think they could use uh, some academic support or both. And what we found is that you know, uh, sites don't tend to uh, limit the youth that can participate, and they see that the program can really reach all kinds of youth even youth who may be, say, behavior problems and other programs, because of the hands-on engaging nature of the STEM activities often thrive in this particular program. So we don't put a limit on who gets recruited. We choose to implement our program in sites and locations that have a lot of community risk factors. So we already know that uh, the population that we're reaching is you know, going to meet our recruitment goals, and then we really leave it up to the coordinators to determine which youth would benefit most from the program, and then also that those youth and their families commit and understand that it is a year-long program. So we want the youth to want to participate and their families to understand the commitment as well. Got it. That's great. Charlie, how about you? Are you looking for a specific type of type of student, a type of student that would do better in the program than maybe another student? What do you think? Great, thank you. Yeah. So with our programs, since we're a bit smaller, we are looking for youth who are from under resourced backgrounds and may not have all of the tools and the resources at their schools to explore STEM and all of the ways that they would like to, um, but they're also really motivated and they're excited about the opportunity to challenge themselves um, and to kind of participate in rigorous activities. Um, our program is a bit rigorous and it takes place over the course of two years, so we're looking for students who really have the time to commit to the program and to you know schedule time along with all of the other things that they have going on in high school because they're involved in so much, um, to also be a part of our program and to grow in our program. And we also look for youth who um, really enjoy hearing diverse perspectives because we are a diverse program. We look for students who are open to learning from their peers about their experiences and about you know, their skills in the STEM fields because oftentimes our students learn the most from each other. And so we look for students who are open to those experiences. And then lastly, we also look for scholars who enjoy hands-on collaborative projects um, and who like to work in groups and really prototype and create new things together. Perfect. Thank you for that. And so if I flip in the script just a bit to recruitment of mentors. So if a mentor was interested, a potential mentor was interested in joining your programs and participating, but they had no background in STEM, no experience, no background, but they're interested in this work, would, would that person be a good fit for your program? Uh, Laura. Uh, for our program, absolutely. We write our materials in such a way that anybody, you know, even a a 13-year-old uh, teen mentor could lead the session. So, you know, part of the 
experience is actually having the mentors and the mentees do the activities and learn uh, what they're uh, supposed to be doing together at the same time so that it's not really a, a teacher learner situation but they're learning side by side and, and working as a team and the mentor is more of a guide in some cases so it's great if they have a STEM background you know we certainly have sites that form partnerships with say a science or engineering program at university and get their mentors that way but for our particular program it's absolutely not a requirement and we know that STEM can actually be scary for uh, some adults and, and even some of our program coordinators so we try to make it as accessible as possible for anybody to be able to implement. Great. How about you Charlie? Definitely similar to Laura, we look for mentors who come from a wide range of backgrounds and you have a diverse you know, amount of experiences. And so our mentors do not have to be in the STEM field currently in order to work with and support our scholars as they develop as leaders. And so with our program, we look for mentors who are excited to you know, support our scholars develop their leadership skills. Because in order for our students to prepare to be leaders in the STEM fields, they need to also think critically about what does it mean to be a leader and how can they grow as a leader and set goals for themselves in the long term. And we think our, really, our mentors are really helpful in that process and that our mentors don't need to have expertise in STEM at all to support our students in thinking about those things. And so we really look for um, you know, adult professionals and undergraduate students who are looking forward to supporting our students in the process of kind of working through these different projects rather than the content. And they're really also similar to Laura, um, willing to learn with our scholars about the STEM topics that they're, you know, working on with these projects and to learn from the scholars too, because our scholars are also really passionate about these things and can oftentimes teach um, mentors about their experiences and their knowledge. So no, we don't um, just look for ex experts in the STEM fields to serve as mentors with our program. We really like to welcome everyone. Great. Thank you for that. And then just a bit more um, in terms of training. So training for your mentors. What, what do you provide? Charlie? Definitely. So with our program, we have um, different levels of involvement with the mentors who volunteer to work with our scholars. So we're actually currently in the middle of our staff training. Um, we have undergraduate students who work with our scholars throughout our four-week summer leadership session and serve as mentors to groups of 15 to 17 students. And so the training for these mentors is about two weeks long, so it's pretty intensive. Um, and they're just exploring a wide range of issues related to youth and identity, and also how to teach and facilitate discussions with our, with our scholars. Um, but then kind of other forms of mentorship, for example, our year-long community innovation projects, our mentors with those projects meet with our students one to two times a month. And so we have just a short professional development sessions with our mentors before each of our meetings with the scholars and the mentors together, um, where we talk with mentors about strategies to engage and motivate our scholars, and also kind of introduce different topics that we'll be focusing on for each workshop. Um, so that's much less intensive and kind of just allows for mentors to get to know each other and to share ideas for supporting our scholars. Um, so the training really just depends on the level and a level of involvement of the mentor in the program. Great. And Laura, how about you? What do you do to help train your mentors? Sure. So we actually use a train the trainer model because we're such a large program and we have sites in over 30 states. We bring all of our site program coordinators together to train them in the program on best practices and mentoring and then also the STEM content. And then we have them go back to their sites and do the recruiting and training of the mentors, which we'll support them with. We provide them with PowerPoint slides that have information on you know, what is mentoring and what are things you should and shouldn't talk about with your mentees and things like that. And we provide them forms for uh, applications for the mentees and the mentors. and advise them on background checks and things like that but then ultimately it's up to them to train the mentors so they usually will do a, a more intensive training right at the start of the program after they've recruited all their mentors to introduce them to the program and then throughout the program they do check-ins our site coordinators are there for every session and so they can check in with the mentors either right before or right after to find out how things are going and then in between curriculum modules 
they can either share the webinar that we deliver to the site coordinators on the next module's content, or they can choose to conduct their own training on that with the mentors. And then every so often, the sites will also just bring the mentors together to talk about things that are working or not working, if there's any concerns with their mentees or things like that. So uh, it's a little bit different since we're more spread out, but it's been successful for us. Gotcha. Thank you for that. And now a bit about program sustainability um, and thinking about because when we create our programs, we want them to last, we want them to, to, to have some longevity. So I'd love to talk to you about any partnerships that you have been able to develop with local companies or other businesses and just how you're able to sustain your program. Laura, how about you? Sure. So we work with a wide variety of partners, um, both nationally and regionally and then also at the local level. I would say the biggest uh, partnerships that have benefited us have been with our content development in reaching out to other organizations that work with the populations that we're intending to serve. So I mentioned that for a couple of our curriculum modules this year, we partnered with uh, First Lego League Junior and Cal Ripken Senior Foundation and really were able to share our lessons learned with them and hear about their experiences working with youth and then combine their content into our program model in order to provide something really powerful and tested to our youth. And then at the local level, we really encourage our sites to form partnerships with uh, whoever in their community could be an asset to them. So that might be a church across the street. It could be a good source of mentors, or maybe there's a bank in town that does a work release program to allow mentors to come out during the workday to work with youth or a college or a university nearby. And so we will uh, work with our sites on an individual basis to identify those partners. And if it is part of our grant-funded program, you know, grants do come to an end. And so we talk a lot about sustainability. We give the partners the tools that they need to continue to run the program and encourage them, say, if they've developed a relationship with a business that's provided mentors to maybe see if that business might be interested in helping to fund the continuation of the program, which is definitely less costly than starting it up from scratch. Great. Thank you for that. And Charlie, how about you? Any partnerships that you've been able to develop? Definitely. So sort of similar to Laura, we have looked into resources that we already have here at Illinois Institute of Technology to develop content and programming for um, our scholars throughout the year. And since we're housed at a university, um, we work a lot with our professors here at IIT to develop you know, project challenges and other activities for our students to participate in, especially in the summer leadership session, as well as during the academic year. Um, these can be like small classroom-based projects to longer-term projects as well. And then our, the professors and staff members here at IIT are also able to connect us to local companies and organizations and here in Chicago where we go with our scholars and participate in job shadow days at these companies like architecture firms and engineering firms. Our students are able to kind of visit those firms and interact with STEM professionals um, and really kind of share their experiences with those professionals. And we've learned that kind of having our students gain exposure to those um, fields really motivates the professionals to support our program more or to kind of become more involved with our program because they're able to meet our scholars and get to know how um, motivated and excited our scholars are to learn about STEM. And another thing we really like to focus on with building partnerships with companies and organizations in Chicago that focus on STEM are to make sure that the opportunities are mutually beneficial to both our program as well as to their program. So for example, with our Serving Through STEM projects, um, when you know, a company or an organization in Chicago proposes an issue that they're experiencing to our scholars, our scholars are able to learn from those professionals and interact with them, but then are also create something that they propose as a solution to the, the professionals that they oftentimes will implement and use at their companies. Um, and so we make sure that, you know, it's mutually beneficial and that both our scholars and the professionals are really gaining something from working with the Global Leaders Program. Great, thank you for that. 
and now starting a program. This is this is one of the burning questions I know that that, that a lot of folks are, are curious about. Is that how do you go about starting a, a STEM-based program? And if you guys have some tips that you're willing to share with the audience, I think that would be great. Charlie, can you kick us off? Definitely. So kind of to go off of the last question, we when we have started to create our curriculum for our program and the different products that we have our scholars work on, we really looked to build off of assets that already exist um, at IIT and within our office. And one um, thing that really stood out to us is the design thinking framework, which is this engineering framework that we've used for a really long time here at IIT. Um, and it was kind of the basis of our curriculum. And we decided that we would kind of use that to model the products that we developed and that we created. Um, and that was a really great way to begin to develop our curriculum, as well as developing curriculum that focuses on you know, some approaches, whether it's hypothesis testing um, or design thinking, really thinking about different STEM approaches and how you can incorporate that to curriculum that you already have developed, even if you are not a STEM program. Um, and we really like to expose students to a wide range of careers in STEM. So we like them to participate in a lot of different things. Um, it doesn't have to be just you know, hands-on projects that you develop curriculum for. You can take students to job shadow days at companies in your city um, or invite a, profession, a panel of professionals to share their experiences in STEM with students. Um, so those are also other ways to kind of begin to start a STEM program by having students learn in more informal ways than just hands-on programming. Um, and we really have also thought it, found that it was beneficial in starting a program to partner with people and professionals who are already experts in the STEM fields. Um, and our engineers, our architects, our professors were able to offer us guidance and support as we develop our curriculum. So we really looked to them um, for that content knowledge and to learn from them as we began to start our program. Um, and lastly, just thinking about funding, if it's a mentoring program that you'd like to develop more formally, um, Finding funding through companies and, and those partnerships that you develop is a really great way um, to be sustainable and to start a program and not just foundations. Um, we've kind of found that by networking with companies and organizations that we do job shadow days with and other events, we've been able to you know, continue our program and, and make it sustainable. Thanks for that, Charlie. Laura, how about you? What are some tips that you can share with the audience? Um, sure. So uh, we put together a few extra slides here at the end, and this one sums up the, the absolute minimum of what you need to get started, which is either an existing mentoring program or the desire to create one, and STEM activities and supplies, which don't have to be expensive. And that's the bare minimum uh, if you'd like to get started with this. But then, then there's more things you can do if you want to go a little bit deeper. And these are some things we'd recommend. So as Charlie mentioned, you know, identifying community partners is just key, both for finding sources for mentors, any enrichment activities you might do, and then funds to run and or sustain the program. Professional development for program staff is also important, especially if they've never done STEM or mentoring before, uh, making sure they have the skills that they need and the confidence to deliver either one of those Aspect is important, but then when they're combined, you really want them uh, to be confident that they can do it. Finding an appropriate space is also important, depending on whether it's going to be a site-based program or you're going out into the community. If it is at a site, you know you want you don't want to do it in the computer lab if you're going to be using you know vegetable oil and pouring it from one container to another. So you want to have a, a place where the mentors and the mentees can meet and do what they need to do without interfering with other things. And if it's going to be, you know, more of an active sort of collection of activities where they're running around, you know, playing a predator prey game, you want to make sure you have access to a outdoor space or a gymnasium or something like that. And then training for mentors and mentees and families we found to be really important. You know, of course, you always want to train your mentors, but, you know, training Training the mentees or orienting them is equally as important so that they know what they're getting into and that they don't think it's just, you know, meeting on Wednesdays to do science, but that they're actually joining a mentoring program that happens to also have STEM activities as part of it. And then community resources, we also, you know, want to emphasize the importance of those and some tips that we've uh, come across over the years are if you have colleges and universities, they can be really great partners. And as 
The question came up earlier, retaining them across semesters and or summer can be a challenge. So uh, our, our solution to that in many sites has been to engage their teens and they can commit to the entire program often, but they also have conflicts. They might decide to go out for a sport or to join the choir and, and that can be tricky. So it's also nice to have a stable of standby mentors we found. So you might have some adults or teens who can't participate in the full range but are willing to pinch hit in case a mentor has something come up and that can be really helpful, especially because like our program is designed really work without the mentors there and so if you had all your mentors um, drop out or not show up you couldn't run the program but if you have one miss every so often and you have some teens or adults who are willing to step in on short notice that can get you through those blips and then also having a, a list of standby folks who are willing to step in uh, and be full-time mentors if somebody needs to exit the program and then lastly the formal and informal STEM organizations in a local community can help with the STEM enrichment activities and possibly some other areas as well. So then just some of the lessons that we've learned by doing this sort of thing. Um, right now I mentioned we are working with six to nine year olds, but we worked with STEM mentoring programs with uh, kids ages six to 13 over the past 10 years or so. And these are some things we've learned. Um, that one, you really do need to emphasize both aspects of the program and the commitment required up front so that everybody understands what they're doing. And even just naming the program something that has both STEM and mentoring in it, which is why we call ours the STEM mentoring program, is helpful so that the kids and the mentors know what they're getting into. And then we've not always done this, but we found that including the warm-up activities really helps uh, at the, part, at the start of each session, so they're not doing the STEM the whole time, but they're getting to do some more informal interaction. And then also allowing time for informal discussion before, during, and after the activities. And you know, they certainly do build their relationship while they're doing the activities, but a lot of times it's those moments in between where they're talking about you know, just what happened during their day that can be just as powerful. And then the last piece is involving everyone and shared experiences outside of the normal program structure. So going on a field trip or doing other enrichment activities is also a great time you know, for the mentees and the mentors to deepen their relationships. So if they're going to say a zoo after they've done their endangered species curriculum, just that time spending, spent with the mentees and their small group and their mentor at the zoo can be a great time for them to you know, have some deeper conversations. And then uh, this Great. final, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, thank you for that. I was just going to highlight uh, a couple additional resources that are there on your screen, uh, STEM resources from the After School Alliance. Uh, and there's, there's your website there. Uh, they have general resources and assessment tools, professional development, curriculum, uh, partners, and then also checking out the STEM mentoring resources from, directly from, from Laura and her organization at C. Uh, also, if you were interested in reaching out to either Charlie or Laura, we're going to encourage you to go to their websites and find them there. If you have specific questions that you want to pick their brain about, then please do that. And we want to see if we have maybe one more question. We're running out of time. If we have just one more good question, Melissa, what do you got? Yeah, so, I mean, there are a lot of questions, but um, we, this one kind of stood out because I think that both um, Laura and Charlie can answer it. Where can we find ideas for STEM activities that our program can implement? And Laura first. Sure, so uh, back a, a slide ago was actually, I would suggest that one of the best resources to start that After School Alliance has a wonderful collection of resources for all ages. If you go to uh, the general resources or the curriculum, you'll find a lot of ready-made, often free resources. If you already have a mentoring program and you just want to plug in some STEM activities, that would be a great place that I would recommend starting. And then I know another link that is going to be shared later is called the Connectory, and that is a huge collection uh, community of folks interested in STEM, and that will also help you recruit volunteers if you want to start a STEM mentoring program who are interested in that, and it'll also highlight uh, programs already in existence in your community that you might be able to partner with. So I would start with After School Alliance and the Connectory, and, and you should find what you need there. 
Great, thank you. Charlie, do you have any other resources that you'd like to share? Definitely. So our program has certainly looked to the After School Alliance for resources and toolkits for different you know, projects that we've had our scholars work on, as well as lesson plans, and that's been really beneficial for our program. And then also meeting with, you know, teachers at the different high schools that our scholars attend to talk with them about, you know, what they're doing with students and how our program can build off of that and ideas that they have for activities, as well as STEM professionals um, and partners that we've worked with have really helped us develop innovative and creative activities for our scholars to participate in that they might not have the opportunity to do so in a classroom. So yeah, in addition to those resources online, also meeting with partners in person and talking with them about um, how they engage with STEM has been an approach that has worked very well for our program. Great, thanks so much. And just as a reminder to all the, um, all the uh, participants that these slides will be available about a week after um, this webinar ends. We are recording it. So all the resources and everything that we're talking about will be available um, online. And also, actually, we just have one more question that I'd really like to ask. Um, Charlie, uh, if you could answer this for me. Uh, what does training and supporting mentors in your program look like? And do you provide best practice toolkits to each mentor? Definitely, that's a really great question. So training for our program, again, looks different depending on the level of involvement of our mentors. Um, so for our mentors that work with our summer session, we have very intensive training that takes place over two, two weeks where we have outside um, organizations you know, come and host trainings for our student mentors that, that are undergraduate students here, as well as we lead training sessions for them on leadership and STEM learning. Etc. And then for our mentors that kind of volunteer with our program less regularly, um, we do create toolkits for them um, and kind of best practice sheets for each stage of the project that they support our scholars in to think about how they can, um, you know, offer support to students and you know motivate our scholars and for them to learn about the different content that we're having students engage in before they meet our scholars. Um, so we do create you know, toolkits and, and worksheets that allow them to prepare to support our scholars before they begin to volunteer. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, Cheryl, you want to take it away? Yeah, thanks, Melissa. And great, great, great responses, guys, and great questions. Thank you to the audience. A uh, couple, couple closing bits. Uh, if you see some additional resources on your screen there, this is the toolkit that Laura was referencing. Uh, toolkit Becoming a Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Mentor from the Corporation for National and Community Service. And also the Connectory, which is a comprehensive portal for STEM offerings. These are great resources we encourage you to check out. And a few more, the National Mentoring Resource Center, this is what we referenced early on. We encourage you to get no-cost technical assistance for your program. Uh, whether you need help and assistance with recruitment or planning or program design, evaluation, or anything in between, uh, you can request free technical assistance through the National Mentoring Resource Center. And it's a resource that's funded by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, and it's facilitated in partnership with Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership. And it's wherever you are in the U.S., we are happy to assist you. Additionally, we encourage you to register your program with the Mentoring Connector. It's a national database of mentoring programs. It's a searchable, or searchable zip code database that allows mentors and mentees to connect from around the country, so you can find a program wherever you are. It's also connected, connected to LinkedIn and My Brother's Keeper, the MBA CARES Initiative, and so many other avenues for free program advertisement. After the webinar, we're going to ask you to, to, to assist us uh, by, by letting us know what worked and what, what didn't work. We're always curious as, a, as to if these webinars are effective, if you're getting what you need. So please remember to complete the survey directly after it, after this webinar. It only takes a couple minutes, and it will help us in helping you just to figure out what we need to tweak and work on. 
And also you will get the email with information on how to download the slides and the recordings and all the resources that we talked about. It's going to be on the, on the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar uh, webpage and also on the Mentor website. And stay connected. Uh, you'll see our email address on the, on the on the screen there. You can you can email us. You can tweet us using the hashtag uh, mentoring webinar, and you can visit our webpage on the mentor website for past and upcoming webinars. And we hope that you're going to join us again next month. We do these these webinars every single month, and our next one is going to be July 21st, and it's on mentee training. And we hope that you will join us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope you have a great day. Thank you.